Hello everybody and welcome to this month's IMV Imaging Journal Club. My name is Sam, I'm one of the vets here in IMV and it's my turn to present Journal Club this month and I'm looking at a paper which examined the evaluation of diagnostic and prognostic usefulness of abdominal ultrasonography in dogs with clinical signs of acute pancreatitis. If you're new to Journal Club or you've not joined us before, just a quick recap of how it works. Um, each month, a member of the IMV Imaging team will choose a paper or critically appraised topic um, that they find um, interesting, and they will do a monthly presentation on it. We make these presentations available for the month but for everybody to watch on demand. But if you are watching the presentations and you have any questions or comments or uh, any queries, please get in touch. You can do so using our email address, which is clinical at imv-imaging.com com or you can pop any questions into the question and answer box which is the little question mark icon on the display on webinar.net and that will come to us and we'll try to get back to you So as I said, uh, this month's research paper was one I chose. Um, it was from this year, and it was looking at the evaluation of diagnostic and prognostic usefulness of abdominal ultrasonography in dogs with clinical signs of acute pancreatitis. And it was a paper that was published in the Journal of the American Veterinary Medical Association. So a little bit of introduction on acute pancreatitis. So acute pancreatitis is a challenging condition um, to diagnose, partly because the clinical signs are non-specific. So we've popped in a box there some of the typical clinical signs we see in dogs with acute pancreatitis. And as you can see, they are, um, they are signs that are, are present in a number of pathological conditions. And um, so a lot of non-specific clinical signs that we see. So the diagnosis of acute pancreatitis relies on, on a number of different diagnostic tools, the clinical signs and history, any blood results, abdominal ultrasound plays a part, and responses to medical therapy can play a part as well. And advanced imaging modalities are something that's becoming to use more often now in a lot of settings where CT is available um, for examining the pancreatic tissue. But it is a difficult um, to, condition to diagnose for the reasons that the signs are non-specific and it needs these multiple um, diagnostic um, modalities to, to, to firmly establish diagnosis. And establishing a prognosis from that information can be similarly difficult as well. As we've noted, abdominal ultrasound plays a part with acute pancreatitis. So there's a number of ultrasonographic changes that we can see and observe when we have a patient with acute pancreatitis. So on ultrasound, we may see enlargement of the pancreas itself. We might see the pancreatic tissue become hypoechoic, and we will often see hyperechogenicity of the surrounding mesenteric fat as well. In addition, we may also notice dilation of the pancreatic and common bile duct. There may be focal free abdominal fluid or more diffuse abdominal fluid present. You can get thickened gastric or duodenal walls as those G gastrointestinal structures um, are located close to the pancreatic tissue. And you may also see ileus and corrugation of local intestine. Again, that's something you may see, for example, in the duodenum, um, where they're, uh, again, with its close proximity to the right limb of the pancreas. And you can also see the formation of pancreatic cysts or abscesses. So there's a number of ways in which our, our, our ultrasound can help guide us to a diagnosis of pancreatitis. Um, um, just to highlight this, we've got two images on the right of the screen at the moment, um, just showing um, uh, some examples of pancreatitis in canine patients. The one at the top um, just shows the left limb of the pancreas. You have the stomach just sitting cranial to it, which is noted by the blue arrow. The spleen in the near field, quite close to the lateral body wall, noted by the green arrow. And then just caudal to the pancreatic tissue, we have the transverse colon, which is noted by the red arrow, which is a little bit obscured in this um, still image. But we can see the pancreatic tissue in the center of these um, other anatomic landmarks. And we can see in this case, the left limb of the pancreas has become very hypoechoic, whilst the surrounding fat has become a little bit brighter. And we where we're taking our measurement of the um, pancreas, we can see that um, it is slightly enlarged when compared to reference ranges in this case. 
Just below the image below that um, is of the right limb of the pancreas adjacent to the descending duodenum. This is a more, um, a more severe example of pancreatic changes. So we have the duodenum and transverse section denoted by the red arrow. And then immediately adjacent to it, we've got the enlarged hypochoic pancreatic tissue denoted by the blue arrow. And just adjacent to it, we've got some hyperechoic reactive fat tissue, which is where the asterisk is marking as well. So these are just some examples of how acute pancreatitis appears on abdominal ultrasonography. So the aim of this study um, was to report the abdominal ultrasound findings in dogs with clinical signs of acute pancreatitis during the first two days of hospitalization and to compare the findings on abdominal ultrasound with the severity of the disease and the mortality rate. And their hypothesis was that in dogs with clinical signs of acute pancreatitis, abdominal ultrasound findings of acute pancreatitis may not be present at hospital admission, but they may develop later during hospitalization. And they also hypothesized that severe acute um, pancreatitis in dogs may be associated with more severe abdominal ultrasound changes and higher mortality rates compared with milder cases of acute pancreatitis. So the method of the study, this was um, looking at dogs between 2017 and 2019 that had been presented at a university teaching hospital. They were part of a, a cohort of dogs that had been enlarged, enrolled in a larger prospective study at the hospital. Each of the dogs had had a complete blood count via chemistry and coagulation profile on admission to the hospital. And acute pancreatitis was suspected in each case where the dogs had two of the following clinical signs, abdominal pain, diarrhea, vomiting, and anorexia or intapotence, where the dogs had hematologic variables indicative of acute inflammation, and where there was an abnormal result in a point of care canine pancreatic lipase immunoassay which is a point of care test with a 91 to 94% sensitivity and is 71 to 70% specific. From the dogs that had been enrolled, they also had access to stored serum samples from the time um, of, that they had been admitted that were um, stored frozen. And they sent those for uh, samples for a quantitative canine pancreatitis pancreatic lipase test, which is 71% sensitive and 100% specific. And uh, with that specific test, they use these bandings of the blood results um, to categorize the uh, samples from the dogs as normal, indeterminate, or diagnostic of acute pancreatitis. They also reviewed the dog's medical records, their abdominal ultrasound reports and images. Dogs were excluded from the study if they had incomplete records or which had not had the entirety of the pancreas visualized on abdominal ultrasound. This was based on their assessment of the ultrasonographer reports from the time. Dogs without acute pancreatitis, i.e. those that had no ultrasound findings indicative of acute pancreatitis and a low result on the quantitative CPL test, were excluded, as were dogs with clinical signs of acute pancreatitis, what, which had persistently negative acute ultrasound, uh, abdominal ultrasound findings and indeterminate CPL assays as well. So in the dogs in the study, uh, abdominal ultrasound was performed on admission, uh, uh, on admission then every 24 hours up to two days. And what they did was they divided the dogs into those that had ultrasound positive signs of acute pancreatitis and those that did not. So just as we discussed before, they were looking for a hyperchoic, more heterogeneous pancreas. They were looking for a hyperechoic surrounding mesenteric tissue, and they were looking for the presence of an abdominal effusion as well. Dogs that did have positive ultrasound signs were scored using a severity index. So they were scored as being mild if they had a hypoechoic, heterogeneous, enlarged pancreas alone. They were moderate if they had those changes to the pancreas plus um, changes in the echogenicity of the surrounding fat, along with focal um, abdominal fluid. And they were categorized as severe if they had those pancreatic alterations with more diffuse abdominal mesenteric fat hyperechogenicity and more diffuse free fluid throughout the abdomen.
The image on the right is just an image of the normal pancreatic tissue, just adjacent to the dorsal medial border of the descending duodenum. And we can see that in, in a normal case where the pancreas is uh, not inflamed, it's quite indistinct from the surrounding mesenteric tissue. And this is just a nice image of the tra a transverse image of the right limb of the pancreas at that location as well. Dogs in the study were also had an a K9 acute pancreatic severity score performed, which is a more novel scoring method um, for looking at the severity of pancreatitis cases. This is based on a calculation that is done from four main parameters, the presence of systemic inflammatory response syndrome, which is related to clinical parameters that you can see in the red box indicating systemic inflammation, so changes to heart rate, respiratory rate, and um, temperature, white blood cell count as well. It involved the presence of coagulation disorders, which was based upon thrombocytopenia and the prothrombin time and activated partial thromboplastin time. It also uses whether there is raised creatinine and um, reduction in ionized um, calcium within the blood as well. So they also used this scoring system to score dogs within the study and group them based on whether they had a score of less than 11 or greater than 11 on that score. Um, it wasn't explained too well exactly what the groupings meant, but the assumption would be that those over 11 had more of a severe pancreatitis score than those below 11. So the results went that after exclusions from the study, there was 37 dogs left. The mean age of the dogs was around 10 and a half, plus or minus three and a half years. So fits with what we'd expect from cases with acute pancreatitis, and it's generally seen in middle-aged and older dogs as well. 11 of the dogs actually died during hospitalization. Two were for reasons other than acute pancreatitis. But even with that, it highlights just potentially how severe this condition can be and how difficult it is to treat it and that it, is, um, it, it can cause uh, quite a high mortality rate as well. And with the dogs that were in, uh, in included in the study with the K9 acute pancreatitis scores, Four of them had a score of zero, 22 of them had a score of eight, you had five with a score of 11 and six with a score of 12. 24 of the dogs in the study had signs of acute pancreatitis on abdominal ultrasound admission. 10 of them developed signs within two days and three dogs did not develop signs of abdominal ultrasound changes um, indicative of acute pancreatitis during the study duration. The results showed that there was no association between the mortality rate and the abdominal ultrasound findings of acute pancreatitis. There was no significant difference in the canine pancreatic lipase concentration between dogs in the ultrasound, uh, abdominal ultrasound positive and negative groups. And of the 34 dogs with positive abdominal ultrasound signs, Five were categorized as mild using their ultrasound M scoring system, 18 were categorized as moderate, and 11 were severe on the severity score as well. So there was a significant association between those dogs with severe abdominal ultrasound findings um, in that it uh, was associated with a higher rate of death. There was a significant association between the canine acute pancreatitis, pancreatitis score and mortality rate, but there is no significant association between the canine acute pancreatitis score and abdominal ultrasound findings um, or their severity as well. So just looking at the uh, points that were raised during the discussion of the paper, uh, using the severity index may improve the prognostic value of abdominal ultrasound. So as they found that uh, dogs with, that were categorized as severe using the abdominal ultrasound scoring system, the grouping system they used, uh, had a higher rate of death. Um, that potentially means that using a similar kind of categorization system may help with prognosis. And it makes sense in that the dogs with more severe signs, i.e. those that had signs of diffuse 
um, abdominal hyperecogenicity and more diffuse free fluid accumulation had more severe disease as well. This, this rings true as well for the um, canine acute pancreatitis score and the fact that it was associated with the mortality rates, but not the ultrasound findings, because the acute pancreatitis score, again, is a gauge of systemic disease. Looking at the coagulation um, parameters, it examines the systemic inflammatory um, score and the creatinine and um, hypocalcemia. These are all indicative of, again, more systemic changes, where some of the ultrasound scoring changes were more local so especially for the mild and moderate groups they were looking at focal changes around the pancreas which may not necessarily involve wider systemic changes in the same way as well um, interestingly, they noted that um, dogs can have normal abdominal ultrasound with raised CPL levels. Um, again, this is um, something that uh, makes sense. CPL has a half-life of around 90 minutes as well, and is specific for acid or cell injury within the pancreas. So it's quite possible that we may see raises in CPL levels prior to more changes um, being present that would be detected on ultrasound as well too. And because of that reason, they found that um, there was a good indication for dogs with raised CPL changes being monitored with um, repeat abdominal ultrasound examinations. We saw a number of those dogs in the study develop ultrasound, um, abdominal ultrasound positive symptoms of pancreatitis post hospitalization as well. So again, it just looked at that sort of utility for um, repeating ultrasound examination in these cases. There are a number of limitations to study. It was quite a small study, so there was a smaller number of dogs. There was no information on pancreatic cytology, so there was no way to know that some of the cases that were included may have had um, pancreatic neoplasia or, or other changes as well. And they also noted, the author, that there was a 2D cut cutoff for abdominal ultrasound, um, which is quite arbitrary. So it would be interesting to know whether the dogs that had not shown ultrasonographic signs of acute pancreatitis may have developed it later, but that wasn't, wasn't known. So again, it, it, certainly the study did indicate that it's worthwhile performing repeat ultrasound examinations on these patients, but it'd be interesting to know if, if all of them eventually did display some signs of acute pancreatitis. So what do we think the clinical relevance of these um, changes are? Well, I think there's a number of things that I would take home after kind of assessing and reading the paper a little bit. And um, one is still important to remember that especially in the acute stages, uh, patients with acute pancreatitis may not may have an ultrasonic, ultrasonographically normal pancreas as well. So that's something that's been noted before, just because there aren't changes on ultrasound, it doesn't mean there isn't inflammation there as well. But what's very interesting and what's sort of highlighted um, throughout the paper, uh, again, is just the utility of repeat ultrasound examinations for patients with pancreatitis, in that if you have a patient who's hospitalized and we suspect pancreatitis, because it can be a difficult condition to diagnose, I think there's definite utility in performing an initial ultrasound exam and then following it up, especially where we've got to raise CPL and we, we suspect that the patient has pancreatitis. We may see those changes appear later, which help maybe guide our treatment and diagnosis um, um, plan as well for the patient too. And um, it's also the in, worth noting that dogs, where we're seeing dogs with pancreatitis that have diffuse abdominal hyperechogenicity and um, free fluid, there probably will be a poor prognosis. So it's already a very um, a, a very serious condition, but it's, again, this might help guide us just in how we plan or discuss with owners. If we've got those more ch those changes that indicate more of a systemic issue present, it can we can then maybe use those to help guide us to what the prognosis is for that particular patient as well. But definitely um, use for repeating ultrasound examinations and the these cases. That's it. So that's a brief run through of that paper. I hope you found it interesting. I certainly did. If you've got a question, as I said, you can get in touch with us using the clinical at imv-imaging.com or you can put your question in the question mark box just now and it will get to us as well. 
Um, if you have any, we'd love to hear from you anyway. If you have any suggestions for future Journal Club topics or something you'd like us to cover, please let us know. And we hope to see you at future Journal Clubs. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>